Congratulations. You have reached the Corona DSO. 592 Exchange. Thank you. Hopefully still. One from Thunder Bay, moderately well-known person in Thunder Bay. Dave Bates, are you still there? Well, that's me. Yep, I'm still here, Jeff. As well as another guest from Kingston, one shirtless Sam. Are you hey, still Jeff, there? how's it going? Great to be here. Uh, pretty good this week. The weather here is absolutely beautiful and just the right kind of not too hot. You can go out, you can go for a walk. Of course, it's hard to avoid other people in the public parks and the riverbank around here in Saskatoon. Uh, so it's, it's hard to find a place to be in the outside without running into people, which is kind of the whole point during this whole pandemic. But I'm of the understanding that the weather hasn't treated you so well. So what has the weather been like near you? Well, you see, the problem is that Turtle Sam and I were going to go for a fantastic canoe trip. It's called Wider Castle. It's going to be great. I've heard such good things about this place. Came all the way up to the Thunder Bay. Love Thunder Bay. Been here many, many times. Many, many times. And then the day we left, I be pulled out of the driveway and began rolling down the road with canoes and kayaks on the top of our cars. The, the stars vanished from the sky. And the, we just had to check the weather that one last time. We found out the very place we were going to put in was forecasted tornadoes, literal tornadoes, and four inch hailstones or something like that. So, I, I'm sure tornadoes is something that happens in Thunder Bay all the time, right? Like, this is just normal weather there. You kind of expect that. Oh, well, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I got like six tornadoes right now inside my house. There's like six of them. Just hanging out there. <laughs> they're, on the route. they're on the canoe route. That's the problem. That's the problem, right? It's when they're on the canoe route and your canoe gets into them and then you're flying the canoe. I mean, you always start with a flying canoe. It never ends well. Yeah, that's true. It doesn't make the portage as easier, though. Well, yeah, but you got to aim it, right? you got to aim it as it comes down. Yes. And that's really tricky. Yes. Really tricky. Yeah. yeah. It's a little bit more difficult than the whitewater rafting that you control the scent of the canoe. Well, I mean, if you have the right parachutes, mm. like, you have to be prepared for, like, for, if you want to go, if you want to go tornado sailing, you need to have the right equipment, and we did not have, I mean... No, I need a good, like, uh, at least an elliptical rectangular parachute to really, truly be able to guide that thing down. And, like, the rudder, the size of the rudder you need in order to get, to get things to not go out of the way, it's just, it's hard to come by on five minutes' notice. So you were about to leave, you were about to head out, and you saw the weather, and the weather alarmed you, so what happened then? Well, I would say, no, it didn't alarm us, remember. I mean, tornadoes, we're, we're, we're talking tornadoes, right? Well, I've seen, I've, I've heard of tornadoes. I, I, I mean, I've also heard of tornadoes. Besides the sticks that are outside my house right now, of course. Of course. Um, then, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, but we uh, make good use of the day. Yep. Yeah, caught up on some old uh, video game knowledge. Yep, yep. Remember the childhood? 
childhood's a good place to go sometimes. And then uh, we just regrouped, we ate some good freeze-dried food that we freeze-dried ourselves. It's got a freeze-dryer, which is kind of cool. Brought and off the Sam's girlfriend. <laughs> she made some excellent butter chicken. Yeah, right on. And some excellent uh, red pie curry. And we had some penny, all sorts of different things. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and then, and then when we went to the, a lake full of clams. Yeah, there was, uh, they were attacking our feet as we were walking by, but we managed to set the upper foot. Sharp shells, sharp shells. Sure, uh, fellas. Okay. Camped on a, a nice lake there, and then we actually had a nice day the next day with tons of great stars overnight. Yeah, we, we got, got to see some of the Starlink satellites. Oh, you actually like, got to, to see those, uh, was it like unassisted with your eyes, just like you could tell exactly which ones they were, that sort of thing? Well, there was a recent launch not too long ago, and I, I didn't see a true train like, where you get multiple different, well, except more than a couple in a row, but these were, I think there was two, possibly the third one that wasn't really shining that bright all directly, definitely in a row, moving at exactly the same speed, no real perceivable change of distance between the two of them. So I think it's a high probability that they were uh, they were related to the most recent one. But yeah, if I were a gambling man, I'd gamble the rest of the pizza on that. Yeah. Mostly because I'm full and I don't want to have any more. But, yeah, but you know. <laughs> Yeah. So what, as far as the satellites go, one of the names that kind of came up as we were getting ready for the show was Elon Musk, of course, the guy behind these uh, satellites. So what is your feelings about these satellites? Is it, what do you know, et cetera? Et cetera. Well, I know. so uh, there's a lot of concern in the astronomy that they're going to uh, permanently alter the night sky, make them very, if we're make, they're very difficult for amateur astronomers to really do their thing. Mm -hmm. and they're putting on some, some good visors to try to deflect some of the sun rays, silence the, silence the extra noise that we're going to be affected. I don't know how that's going exactly right now. Obviously but, not well enough if you're able to see them with the yeah. naked eye, even in the wilderness outside of mm -hmm. or in northern Ontario. Yeah, but all in all, I think it's a great idea because we're going to have, they've already done some recent speed tests and there was some like 60 megabyte, up to 60 meg that's, megabyte per second download. And that's starting to be pretty uh, quick. And, and the other thing too is like, because they're getting into the habit of putting these satellites up there, it seems like it's getting more and more accessible to put optics up as an amateur astronomer. So like we are losing the ability to have telescopes on the ground here on Earth that are going to be able to get that beautiful, clear and crisp picture of the night sky undisturbed. But at the same time, there's this opening of a possibility that we may be able to have something of a telescope, maybe like a, even just like a cell phone optic level or sized device uh, put in the same orbit as all these other little tiny satellites that are kind of as part of that. Do you think that that might be the case or is that still like way out? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. For sure, yeah. Well, well, we're talking about Archive? Left. Wasn't that the name? Archive? Ar Archid? The name of that? Back uh, urban for probably six years now, I mean, some of the earliest crowdfunded satellites, there was one crowdfunded deep space uh, like a space based telescope that was on a, one of the earlier launches that actually ended up being blown up and not making it to space oh. but uh, it was yeah I, I, I'm not, to be honest I haven't been following the company or the indoor campaigns they're kind of lost interest but. Well, no there's the rideshare program that SpaceX has put together it's, it, it's far cheaper than it's ever been reported for stuff into space so the, this and is a space rideshare program? yeah so um it's, they've already implemented it to a smaller level now with the, because they're putting up all these Starlink satellites, right? Like right. they're, they're uh, Falcon 9 rocket can take 60 of them up at a time. So what they do is they just take off a couple of them. Like, so they'll, they'll launch instead of 60, they'll do 57, 58 or so satellites. And then uh, in the extra space that they have in the fairing, which is the, the storage area in front of the rocket, they put additional satellites from, from external customers to them. So I think the last one's like the, the Black Sky satellites, which are, they launched three of them for a private or organization um, and then they have plans to make it uh, even yeah, to divvy up that space even more so they'll and eventually be having these rideshare programs where it will just be a dedicated launch just uh, the entire pairing will be stacked full of all these little mini satellites i guess they have to get their appropriate regulation hurdles and whatnot crossed over but uh, once they do that then yeah they can put up their own little miniature satellites so like you said the size of a cell phone or so if they wanted to but um, i guess propulsion might be an issue then but the, you know the same same idea so. right yeah. and, and, and propul propulsion isn't yeah. that bad is it, the smaller you get right like if it's already so light right how much energy do you really need to keep it in that orbit is it? Mm -hmm. get, I mean, I haven't done the calculations on that, but it seems like it wouldn't be as hard uh, it, as long as you can get it up there. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm no rocket scientist, but I would, I could see that being probably the case. Mm -hmm. I know there's been a, there's been a huge boom in the number of earthbound telescopes that have popped up, or just a small mini CubeSat that have popped up in you know, over the last couple of years. I know there's a couple of different uh, analytics firms that have an active satellite divisions, and they'll use like we we'll use earthbound satellite telescope point towards the Earth and look at stuff like the activity in different shipping yards or the amount of stockpiling in different, so, in different... So this is like the sort of thing that like the U.S. government did in like the 50s and or maybe even 60s like around the time that they started the space program and like major developed countries through enormous amounts of effort into making as part of the cold war and then now we have like little marketing companies doing this well not market well not, not marketing companies but like the different advisory firms or whatever yeah if you need some price of copper is going to be and say it's handy if you can go just have a quick peek on the secret stockpiles that of copper metal be that are sitting in different ports around the world and just figure out whether they've been moved or not right it's not what used to be the domain solely of the nsa is now for all of us or, or at least the NRI the, or NRO National Reconnaissance Office, anyway. But yeah, it's becoming more accessible for sure. It's going a little bit more in the direction of Elon Musk, though. So, what is your, I guess, feelings on Elon Musk, Dave? Let's start with that. Oh, I have beef with Elon Musk. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yep. What 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 is this beef? Well, well, you see. There are two ways to look at Elon Musk. I mean, you look at his phenomenal rise, incredible success, the, and the fact that all, everything he seems to, to be putting attention into produces these amazing, amazing, incredible results that never been seen before in the history of, of, of the modern world and changing everything. So, like, incredible rapids. You have so two solutions here. And neither of them reflect well upon me. And that's why I have trouble with Elon Musk. The first is maybe he's some sort of time traveler slash alien who's using advanced information. Not likely. I'm, I'm gonna say that. I'm, I'm, I'll straight out and say that that is extremely unlikely to the point of being ridiculous. But it, you know, it has to be said considering the amount of. You know, if there's one around. guy on Earth who's like the time traveler who came back yeah. to mess around and have a good time, that Number would probably be him. Yeah. But and the other one is that he's just. An incredibly driven person who's able to put in a lot of hours and being very, very smart and make things happen. And uh, the fact that if that second one's true, it reflects badly not only on me, but on basically everyone being like, why haven't we done this kind of stuff earlier? It just takes someone who's smart and driven. Is, is he really that much more smart and driven than the rest of the world? I don't think so. I mean, he and, certainly and, is. And but. then the big question along those lines is too, like you can hear, and even when he does interviews in the public, he'll bring in the math. He'll bring in the science background that he has and the knowledge, at least to the level that he's got so far, of the understanding of the current state of the art of what is being published in the science journals, the engineering journals, whatever. Like, he keeps his finger on the pulse of how science is developing, and he's actually gone through at least a significant portion of the work to become well-versed in the engineering math necessary to do stuff like make the boring company work and make these satellites work. And it's worth pointing out that, like, sometimes it's hard to find examples to point out to especially younger people that, oh, hey, it's important to learn this stuff and it's important to know how to do math. Because now we have the example of, and this is what you can do with it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe he called the university himself as the chief engineer of SpaceX. I think he's got a, he's an engineer per se, but he does the job of the engineer. Which is interesting because normally CEOs and whatnot are very separate from that whole, whole thing. Or right. General world is a certain institution, Stephen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but still, it, it reflects badly on all on basically everybody, every, every person applied in a, in a position of authority and, of course, money, because he did have some money to start off with, yeah. that have yet to have leveraged that to make SpaceX before Elon Musk shows up and then just puts his hand to everything and makes it all work. Well, especially when you look at the the numbers based on the competitive contracts that they're getting. What, SpaceX got, I think it was half to a third of the money that Boeing got, and mm -hmm. Boeing still hasn't even produced a single thing yet. But oh, and, 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 they, and, they kept, and NASA kept changing their, their specs at the last moment to make it so that SpaceX suddenly had to rejigger the design because the, the requirements were been adjusted to fit with whatever Boeing was coming up with, it was ridiculous. And they're still and, and they still did it, you know. And they still did it. Yeah, yeah. it looks really cool. <laughs> it looks super cool. cool. And for people who are not in the engineering world, like one of the worst 
things that can happen to you as an engineering team is to have your specifications changed bef like right at the last minute after you've already committed to developing around the previous specifications. Like it's a real kick in the teeth. Like it's, it's not a small thing when that happens. But so as far as working in the, I, Charlotte, Sam, you were a student, right? Yeah, postgrad, yeah. So you're in the postgrad. So without even necessarily going into any of the specific companies or things you've worked at, have you worked in any of these kind of bigger projects or as far as your work uh, side of your life, what is that uh, like? Or has it just oh, yeah. been studenting? Well, I've done, so I've done a lot of different, a lot of different things. Um, <laughs> but uh, well, I was in an engineering program at one point. <laughs> and yeah, I actually did some stuff with, with some satellite broadcasting work, and that was pretty entertaining. But I mean, again, that was a smaller company. That was actually interesting. It got acquired. I, it was a, a co-op term, and I had two co-op terms at this company. And both times, it got gobbled up by a larger fish. So <laughs> I started off. Uh, so like while you're a student or while you're a co-op student working at this yeah. company, it gets eaten sort of thing? Yeah, exactly. It was well, it just bought out by a larger group. It was great. We got all sorts of free lunches and stuff. It was pretty good timing, honestly. But as a grad student, it's pretty much cool. But uh, no, it started off as being a small company really able to navigate the waters and change and whatnot. And you, you, there's a bug in your program. You, just, you find it after you shipped off that particular build to a potential customer. You find it. You can just essentially call up for later, say, stop the shipment and ship off another one right away. Uh, real time, fix the problem. Whereas as you get larger and larger, it's like you have to go through multiple levels and it just slows down the whole process and I can see how that would get bogged down. But, so, uh, so did any of your work make it to space? Well, so it was more just, it was actually more of a, on a data level. So we had satellite simulators. We wouldn't actually do any of the work with the satellites themselves. We and, just, and are you sure it was uh, just a simulator and not like a, what is it, Ender's Game, like question of that you were actually working in the real world without them telling you sort of thing? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, my testing methods might be, uh, might be known to others. And that's not to, uh, I, 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 I didn't exactly follow protocol all the time. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> it was all fun. It worked out well. Actually, we, interestingly enough, we uh, we found some things that we wouldn't have otherwise found, found, and because I was I was a little bored one day, and so that's all. Those are always handy things. So, like the discovery that you would not have found if you weren't bored, that that sort of thing. Yeah, well, exactly. So protocol dictated we send these text files, right? It, and we just analyze them on. But after we send it as a text file, we go we put it through this packet masher, which is essentially. Takes out, put some random errors into it, and it's supposed to the algorithm re-encodes it on the other side, expecting that loss, and is able to fill in the details and fill in the missing areas. So it looked great from a text perspective because you know you just scroll through this 100 megabyte file that has all these different words in it. The words all looked great; they weren't all mangled around or they weren't unreadable. So everything looked good from that end. But I was bored, so I just I decided to throw a picture through a, a JPEG file, and it kept on getting all garbled on the other end. They couldn't figure out what was going on. I realized there's actually just to drop the last like two or three bytes of each packet. And of course the picture is made up of a number of different packets that are then reassembled on the other end. Right. And so just two or three bytes, because it was like JPEG does all these compression algorithms, that was enough to completely throw off the algorithm and we managed to find that problem. That would have been a really major issue if it had gone to market, so. That's really cool. Yeah. So now on the topic of, because in order to do that, you kind of had to think out of the box a little bit and you were, doing things, you're playing around with this idea of what to do with this system, i.e. throwing a picture at it, that isn't like the standard thing that you would normally do. Yeah. And we were talking a little bit uh, before we started about uh, in the university world, especially in the humanities, the question of how easy it is to be that person who thinks out of the box in the university perspective. Now, I'm not a student anymore. It's been about 10 years since I've, well, I don't know, uh, what year is it, 20? Yeah, so about 10 years since I was a student. So I'm a little outside of the loop. But as far as the university system goes, how is the perspective of people who like push that kind of limit? Ah, uh, yes. So the, uh, the burgeoning intellectual monoculture. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> we should no. definitely not have luck for every number beforehand. Definitely. <laughs> so, yes. So yeah, I'm all, all for it. It's a great, we see it more in some, you see this, this issue. So as many people have probably heard of this whole cancel culture thing where opponents pressuring mainstream institutions that are kind of the de facto 
curators per se of social ideas, of societal ideas, and you know it, it seems that they're able to forcing people like the mainstream media, for instance, to really narrow their definition of what's a reasonable opinion to the point where it excludes the ideas of large groups of people. So, you know, I'm all for expanding the range of acceptable ideas to include views of marginalized people and such. But you can't just keep on narrowing the definition of what a reasonable opinion is to the point where there's this massive exclusion. Because you limit the range of the acceptable discourse and the ideas that are available for public discussion, and then that just completely shuts down the whole purpose of the university. It's a lot worse than arts and the humanities and whatnot, certain programs, certain certain areas like that. And it's really hurting academia, in my opinion. So, Dave, have you seen this sort of thing at all? Or are you all as disconnected as I am on this one? On I'm probably disconnected as you are on this one. Okay. I mean, yeah. There really is a, I don't have any uh, themes that would make a whole lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. So, back on Charlotte Sam's side. Uh, so, do you have any examples of this happening at the university level, either in Kingston or um, kind of elsewhere that might exemplify yeah, this? Um, it kind of started to come more to the forefront a couple of years ago. There was a whole debacle with uh, Jordan Peterson, right. the professor of the U of T. He had these ideas, which they were very, um, they were rational ideas. They weren't necessarily ideas that would be widely accepted, but they were rational ideas that couldn't really easily be unpacked as being ideas that are not that shouldn't be accepted as at least for evaluation or for wider discourse. But yet certain groups that just slam them as being just straight up offensive to them, even though there's no burden of proof as to why it's offensive, and they just shut down the conversation before it even starts. And it leads to some, some issues. You can't do that at a university level. And it just, I find it, it's in particular programs, certain programs, it's, becoming more and more of an issue and I, I just I fear for the future of actual open discussion on topics that are not part of that ex or accepted group thinking accepted uh, ideas. I, for instance, in the, a lot of the research, especially, again, social sciences, it's, if you're not a part of that particular mindset, you can't get funding to do your research. And so if there's no research, there's no proof or disproof of any given ideas. And so the people who are already in power are able to just push forth their agenda based on whatever research they've already done. So, and this is in addition to, of course, being that we are in this COVID era, I'm noticing that it's becoming difficult to challenge certain types of institutional roles. Like, for example, I was thinking about running for a public office here in Saskatoon, but in order to do that, I need to get a petition signed, which of course is virtually impossible without compromising the social distancing efforts. So I'm imagining in the university side, this it, sort of thing is also in play as well, where in order to challenge the intellectual ideas of our time, one of the means of doing so is the academic conference or the classroom lecture or the... There's a bunch of different ways to do it that don't involve merely publishing in a, a journal of some kind. That, of course, is probably still possible to do whether or not we're able to meet in public. But there are even things like water cooler discussions around campus, uh, things that... Conversations that can only happen in person and face-to-face -face, that are just either not happening now or are only happening based on the people who have the authority already, right? So, do you, do you see that as well as being kind of a factor local to you? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, I guess it's hard to know exactly what the long-term ramifications of especially COVID will be, right? And it's a bit of, like, I never really considered some of the points that, that you made, which are very valid, for sure, kind of chicken and the egg type of situation in terms of making changes or putting forth new ideas and something like a petition. I mean, like, I haven't run into that issue myself. I don't really go down that path with my work so much. Right. But the, uh, yeah, no, the ideas of face-to-face -face discussion are, are a lot different. And I think we may, everyone is quite quick to jump on the bandwagon of the uh, virtual offices, virtual meetings, which is great. It was an essential, an essential thing. And, uh, and like this, this conversation wouldn't be happening without at least some level of uh, mediated technology, for exactly. example. Oh, and, I'm not, and I think it's great, honestly. I think that it's a bit overdue in terms of widespread acceptance for these types of things, especially in many of the office jobs that are probably functioning just as well. But like you said, you know, the water cooler conversations, there's that certain little idiosyncrasies of office life that are probably maybe overlooked, or the idea of if you have a problem, now you have to spend five minutes typing up an email 
versus uh, taking three steps to the next cubicle and quickly explaining things in a couple of maybe even semi uh, incoherent <laughs> sentence or semi coherent sentences. You know, you don't have to worry about stringing string together eloquent, nicely verbose worded emails because they'll be on the corporation. They'll be permanently stored and people may judge you for them, right? Right. So there's no actual permanent record like there is now. I mean, you can pick up the phone, but then two out of somebody's away from their office. What if they're on another call? What if they're busy doing something and you can't interrupt them, basically? <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to float a half-formed idea, if I could for a second here. Sure, go for it. The, when it comes to COVID, that could actually be that lack of, of interpersonal discussion. I mean, in an informal setting, which is just between it's just two folks meeting up and chatting, that could be a really big problem, or at least a big part of the problem, between the weird bubbling up of misinformation and distrust of, of, of science and vaccine hesitancy and all that kind of stuff that are, that are showing up. Because the kind of people, to my thought, my way of thinking, the kind of people that are most likely to be susceptible to having anti-vaccine or COVID conspiracy or all those kind of clustered idea fools, they're the kind of people who are least likely to be willing to engage in the kind of, well, here's some research, here's some sources, dig it out and understand it. But they're the most likely to be swayed in a personal discussion because that kind of discussion doesn't happen with anyone who isn't already within their mm. group. They're getting the only people who they're discussing with are other people who are, would otherwise be susceptible to that kind of thing. So yeah. or, or worse, yeah. that they're totally isolated and the only thing they have to go on is to be able to research themselves and they don't have the proper research either skills or access to resources like scientific journals to be able to like nudge them away from pure and utter fantasy. So it, it like mm -hmm. you're able to fall completely down the rabbit hole rather than just deep enough that your friend or nearby person can catch you and be like, hey, that's kind of weird. I think the earth exists like or the moon exists, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, yeah but the, the loss of that informal role, the informal third person authority kind of. There's usually that one person in any any group that tends to have a more, uh, slightly of a, a different outlook or different, you know, they may be an expert in that one field and everybody knows them as they're the go-to person and they're not necessarily included in these discussions. Right. I'm thinking of the, in a school setting, like an elementary school setting, there's usually the one teacher in elementary school who maybe has done some more advanced studies or they're just really, really inclined to keep up with new discoveries and information. They, they take the job of knowledge uh, cistern, I guess, very highly, whereas some of the other teachers maybe not so much and they're the ones that they go to whereas now people you know it's a point-to-point -point discussion between two people and that person that they would maybe just put the idea by in the staff room because he's he's sitting there having his coffee or she's over on the uh, and, and it's something uh, to talk about yeah. right like dave like how many times in a normal week pre-covid would someone come up to you and be like hey dave have you heard of this thing in science or this thing in the political world, right? It, that just it, not even necessarily to get your response or it, informed opinion on, but just to like knock something against your head. Like th this sort of thing probably happens to you all the time, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, people are talking about cool stuff or unusual stuff they've heard. And it's really useful because you get a sense of not only the cool things that are happening around the world and in different academic communities you're not necessarily a part of, but you also get a really good sense for what the up and coming falsehood of the week happens to be is mm. that like fake news travels on wings because mm. all sensational yeah mm -hmm. and it's More really not and it's really easy to sort of hear that and be like that sounds really cool but big and if then, true <laughs> yeah here's why that probably isn't the case and then that stops stuff right there but so do you have an example of uh, uh, dave as far as like this week or are you like totally disconnected from that now uh, in terms of like the fake news of the week or the big thing of the week that's going on that you probably think isn't actually accurate or even uh, floating even yeah floating around half-formed ideas and yeah, some, again something you wouldn't want to put into an email per se yeah you wouldn't want to put into the permanent record that is associated with your identity that other people can verify and judge you on right yeah you lose the idea you lose the ability to say now i'm not really sure on this but I think it's this, or, you know, this is why I think this is it. Uh, this is my opinion, and here's why. But, you know, I'm really not, not that much of an authority on the matter or whatnot. But your reasoning process maybe is still there, and you wouldn't think twice about putting in your two cents in a casual conversation. Which, which that sounds pretty close to exactly what Jordan Peterson got in trouble for originally. Like, it wasn't, I mean, there were some things that he said and he was certain of, but there were other things that he was catching flack for that... It was framed in terms of that kind of uncertainty of like, well, maybe 
you know, you're right, but I don't know and I can't verify it and blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, but I, it was all logically coherent though, and that's why people hated him. <laughs> yeah. And, but back to Dave though. So, like, as far as this week though, is there anything going around your circles or that you have encountered that is this kind of like fake news that on wings, that sort of thing? Well, uh, let me think. The most recent things? Yeah. I guess there's, there was a thing that someone said to me talking about how there was proof that COVID 19 wasn't real. And here's the proof. And they showed this a couple snippets from some academic articles. And then they showed a bunch of letters from someone who supposedly did a room and information act request to the different hospitals that were running this, demanding the access to all the information, proving that there was any kind of work done. And the hospital's responses were kind of vague and understandable because they were asking for proof that this came from a patient and what patients had come from. And you can't really do that. Right. And like, like how access to information it. requests, I like I don't know the law off the top of my head, but I would not be surprised if like doctor patient confidentiality trumps that. Like oh, there's there's exactly. general statistics that hospitals like the Thunder Bay Health Science Center, they do publish general overarching statistics about what they're doing during the week or the day or whatever, but like the what's happening to you as a patient who walks into that hospital is protected by PIPEDA and other privacy laws here in Canada. So Yep, well, absolutely. And the thing is that this thing that was sent to me was just someone who didn't understand what Freedom of Information Act requests are for, what they can do, and also didn't understand what the sort of disclaimer in different academic articles saying this is uh, this particular article is for preprint or whatever, don't use it for clinical advice and that kind of stuff. And they misinterpreted that and then confounded their misinterpretation by these so that may have happened, may not even have even happened. Uh, from information act requests, and then somehow took those two results that came up, came with their understanding that they had just proved that COVID had never been isolated from a patient, right. which is, it's on its face, absolutely insane. But if, if someone that doesn't understand what isolating a virus means, or how it's done, how the papers are published, and how the scientific process works, I mean, if you're just scared, it's really easy to just look at this and be like, oh, well, it's all fake anyway. I don't need to worry because yeah. they're all liars because the government's lying to you. And, that, and that means that you're able as an individual to get out of certain social obligations like wearing a mask, yeah. getting tested if you've been exposed, that sort of thing. But going a little bit more specific on the details here. So as far as isolating a virus, in your view, what is what does it mean to isolate a virus in that sense? Do you, I'm, like, is it actually, I'm not a go ahead. I'm not a virologist. Right. I don't, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Cause like, I've heard a variant of this where in epidemiology, there are these principles. I think it's a Coke, if I'm pronouncing it right, uh, principles, where it's in order to prove that a infectious disease exists and is the culprit of, or the thing that causes the disease is the culprit. You have to isolate it. And then with the isolate, infect a human being with it and then watch them be capable of producing the same thing that you isolated basically so it's like a proving all of the steps uh, are actually operating that one there is a disease two you can get the virus and go oh this is the virus and then three infect someone with the virus and then four they get sick and then are capable of spreading it again if you can prove all of those things then yeah you've got an infectious disease and that the the rumor is is that nobody's done this with COVID and I like from what I can tell this may even be a true rumor because it would require a doctor who is charged with keeping human health as a thing that's still happening for their patients like it would involve one of those doctors intentionally infecting someone with COVID which I don't know if anyone's actually done but would be required under this particular protocol that has been used in other diseases although probably Probably not since the invention of things like ethics committees and stuff. But have either of you heard of that sort of thing or? Push postulate. Yeah, that's, that, that's sort of the. We're thinking back way back to microbiology. Yeah, we have, which you can be isolated and show that they can cause the disease for sure. The problem is that you, you can. It can be known that there is, in fact, the disease and that the virus causes the disease. Just by doing a large proper study looking at the transmission of this person to person, because you can identify the pathogen and trace its, its jump from person to person to person, 
you don't necessarily need to take it and shove it into somebody. That, that doesn't need to happen. But again, I'm not a virologist, and it's been a long time since I've been doing anything related to that. So okay. take whatever I do with like a great big heaping table salt. Yeah, and I'm not really, I'm not that uh, familiar with the public health end of, end of terminology and definitions in that respect. I just, you know, just you know, talking earlier today about the difference between an infection versus uh, versus a disease disease process. You know, the infection being the actual well infection, uh, the, and like the, the transmission the of the the pathogen, like the transmission yeah. of the virus, rather than the disease being this process and symptoms that are associated with. Uh, yeah. You know, just like, well, the, the context we were discussing was, was uh, related to, to, you know, STIs versus STDs, and we've gone, made a switch from calling from sexually transmitted diseases to sexually transmitted infections because not, not everybody is diseased because they don't exhibit symptoms, right? right. So. so we are getting close to the end of the show here. So, Dave, is there anything you'd like to get through to the rest of the world now that you have the world's attention? Oh, jeez. Elon Musk, let me into the Starlink program. I want to talk over the over, over your satellites. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Somebody who is closer to Elon oh, Musk, no. get in touch, and we will get you in touch with Dave, and he will do cool things with your satellites. And prove also, his word. Also, also <laughs> answer my, my application is to be led into the, the OpenAI GPT-3 access program. I want to do that too. But, yeah. I'm just going to pause there. So you did apply. What was the reasoning behind your application? Because I think it was actually a good one. <laughs> oh, I've got great reasons. Great reasons for this. Absolutely. The reasons are great and many. As many as they are great. And yeah, well, multitudinous future generations, etc. Yes, yes, many future generations. No, I, in, in, in proof of this, I just have a good reason for it. As part of a lot of the programming that we do at Science North, we do classroom programming with students talking about programming, different types of programming, the digital awareness and understanding of and, and digital literacy. And a lot of programs that are out there are fantastic, for sure. But they don't address artificial intelligence, uh, neural networks, that, that, that kind of stuff. Some do, but it's really easy to talk about that at a surprisingly young age. Kids just get it. Yeah. And so using GPT-2 to generate text that is indistinguishable from a person, on like at first glance, is a really, really handy tool at making kids, even from a really, really young age, understand that what you, the internet can be as full of sharks. <laughs> it's, it's got, if you can't trust things, and, and, cats. and pardon me? And cats. And the internet is full of sharks and cats, yes. Some, sometimes the cats, they're, they're fine to go and pet, but sometimes if you, if you think it's a cat and just commit to petting it, and it's a shark, it'll bite your arm off. If there are a lot of ways to be deceived, and even people who are otherwise incredibly savvy and understanding and digitally literate can make a simple mistake and end up in a whole lot of trouble by trusting that what they see is written by a person or is a person at all. And having access to the GPT-3 program to generate this text that is better than what most people can produce would really help to hammer that point home that, yeah, it doesn't matter how smart you are, you can still be fooled. And here's something that just fooled you. Right. All right. So, and shirtless Sam, any last words to the world now that you have the world's attention? Hmm. Last words. Uh, browsing through my last words list here. Oh, you've got uh, a list for that as well. Very cool. Oh, yeah. Shirtless Sam is, seems like he has some very interesting lists from the sounds of it. Uh, I think I've, I've started making lists for everything. My, uh, my girlfriend actually put me on to that. It used to be very scattered. Now I'm only partially scattered. It's like you're uh, scattered outside of the list. In the list, you got the information. The problem is the list of the list is in all those the organized parts, so it's hard to navigate. But, I don't know, just maybe just watch out for, uh, for any... I guess question your second thoughts before you say them. Yeah, there we go. Question your second thoughts before you say them. Interesting. Mm -hmm. But I'm definitely... I respect the having of large numbers of lists. I, myself, have a to-do list that is completely and utterly out of control. I'm just going to like quickly see the line count here. I think we are at 750,865 things to do today, but that of course is not happening in one day. But thank you both Dave and Shirtless Sam for participating today. And just as a reminder for the rest of you, one, Dave has a company that normally sells maple syrup. So if you're in the Thunder Bay region, whenever they start selling maple syrup again, definitely think about picking some up because... Oh, we're still selling it. We're still selling it. You're still selling it? All right. Oh yeah, our market, come on down. <laughs> 
the farmer's market, which is a, is it still in the, the same place uh, down kind of by the shoppers in the south end a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's still in the Sealy. Yeah. But we're also in a bunch of different school stores all over Thunder Bay. So if you've seen our Western Maple Syrup or Canada Western Maple Syrup, which is our, our other line, get your maple syrup. All right. And as well, if you've enjoyed this broadcast, consider going to subscribe, sir.com slash Jeff dash cliff and that will help me do things like edit it and having decent microphones so i am audible to my guests which is kind of important so uh, with that i will i cut off for the week and all right take care Facebook.